July of 1972, Mr. Earl Butts, our Secretary of Agriculture, uh, proudly announced the largest grain deal in 4,000 years. Yes, he said, larger than that negotiated between Josiah and the pharaohs. Everybody beamed, the farmers who would sell their surplus wheat and corn, the detente people who would be making yet one more gesture of friendship, the economists who would welcome a favorable shift in our balance of trade, and above all, the Nixon administration, which would experience the farmers' gratitude in the polls of the forthcoming election. Unfortunately, the Russians proceeded to uh, exercise their options at such a gluttonous rate, taking advantage of our internal subsidy arrangements and our credit arrangements. That we threw our domestic grain business into chaos, and it is the variously estimated, it has been variously estimated that the subsequent increase in the cost of food to Americans of all kinds is traceable anywhere from one-third to three-quarters of it to the great grain deal of 1972. There was the additional picasse that we were making it cheaper for Russian communists to buy bread than for American Republicans. The scandal prefigured much of the ongoing consternation about the program to deal with hunger in the world. In Kansas City here resides one of the top American authorities on the general subject. He exercises as editor and publisher of Milling and Baking News, something like sovereignty over those who think about the problems of grain agriculture and economics. All the more remarkable since his weekly magazine has a circulation of about 5,000, but it is the Jane's fighting ships of the trade and Mr. Sosland, who left Kansas City only to attend Harvard College during the war, is its owner and policymaker. He is widely consulted by everyone from American presidents to communist spies. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Sosland if he predicted the impact of the Soviet uh, grain deal, and if so, when? The prediction of the impact of the Soviet sale I think we all knew at that time that it was perhaps the most dramatic thing that had ever happened in the grain economy of the world. No one really understood until about six months late or later how important it was going to be. I've kind of had the thesis all along that what the Soviet Union did beside its own purchases is to send out a signal to the rest of the world saying, here is a communist country that controls its people, is a police state, and we have to buy a billion dollars worth of grain to keep our people satisfied and happy. That sent out a signal to the people of Asia and to South America. And so it was just not the purchase of grain alone by the USSR that created the inflation in food prices. It was really this kind of message that no longer was it acceptable for that kind of country to let its people go hungry in years of short crops. So that was gradually emerged and it was difficult, I guess, at the moment in time. We all knew it was the most exciting thing that had ever happened. We didn't know how pervasive it was going to be. So you, th you, think, uh, you think it had an, an ideological uh, uh, meaning, that it was the first time that organized Marxists had, uh, had thought of buying from capitalist countries right. in preference right. to starvation. Right. I mean, just only eight years before, uh, Russia, in a year of short crop, had had bread lines, uh, had had rationing of bread. And this time, in 72, there was a very conscious decision, obviously made in the Kremlin, this will not happen this time. And Russia, in, well, in, well, in effect, said to its people that we're not going to let our livestock numbers be reduced, we're not going to have bread shortages, even though we've had the poorest crop in some years. This was a, a radical change from what had happened before. A lot, a lot of people think it goes back to the Polish food riots of 1970, where there was complaint in that country about the quality of the food, not just shortages. And so Russia has embarked on a conscious program of improving its food quality. Well, if they were, if they were capable of complaining in Russia about the quality of the food, the government would have been overthrown 50 years ago. That's right, uh, but obviously they became more worried this time yeah. as to what had happened, because I, from what you read from Warsaw and, and, and from the early part of this, of this decade, 
that, you know, they almost lost Poland because of food riots, and that hadn't happened before. You know, I, I sort of see it as consumerism gone to Russia and consumerism perhaps ev well, even gone to China. Don't let China at this same time, we've all talked about Russia primarily, but China in the 73 and 74 crop years are really much bigger buyers of American grain than is Russia. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and there's been an acceleration of demand all around the world for our grain. It's just not the Russian. But I look on the Russian thing as, in addition to being the biggest trade in all history, as really being this kind of ideological signal. Well, now, uh, let, let's explore that for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, since we assume it wasn't um, a matter of um, a, a sudden and strange beneficence on the part of the Soviet leaders, you assume that they felt that they could not cope with the internal political consequences of um, a food shortage of these dimensions. Do I understand? That's, you that's certainly that? what, what, what I believe has happened be, uh, uh, in their attitudes. They had announced in the year, two or three years prior to 72 that they were going to embark as part of that five-year program on increasing their livestock numbers on improving the quality of the diet. They, you know, in one of their usual annual kinds of proclamations. Mm -hmm. And when the short crop came, they suddenly were faced with a very important choice to go back on that, to not have meat in the stores, to, to cut back on the quality of the bread. And it's, it's our assumption that it was not done for any other reason, but that there was an internal political decision. That was also the time of Mr. Khrushchev going out, Mr. Brezhnev coming in. And Khrushchev, you know, had, had gone through one of these bread crises and, you know, had been a threat to him. Well, if that, if that is correct, uh, do, you, do you now believe that we missed a historical opportunity, namely that we might at that point have exacted some uh, political and military concessions uh, uh, in return for making the wheat available? There are those who do say, Mr. Buckley, that because of our making wheat available at that time to Russia, and because of our, our willingness to sell food to China, which all came in that same year when Mr. Nixon had gone to Peking, that that is why the Vietnam War was ended. But, but Russia agreed in return for this food. Mr. Butz has said this. Uh, Mr. Kissinger has hinted at it at times, that the availability of American food at that point really was an important factor in persuading them to, for Russia to bring the pressure to bear that ended the Vietnam War. So whether that can be spelled out in terms, I don't know. But uh, there are, but the members of this administration have said that the availability of American grain at that time was an important reason for that. I, I don't, I don't. You know. it, it's, a little, it's a little hard for me to follow because ending the Vietnam War consisted in our pulling out our troops. The war That's hasn't, right. in any no. other respect, ended. Now, if we extracted any, well, any concessions from them at all, it was that's what they say. It was because of the war, and uh, uh, I mean because because, because we, we had, we had the authority to pull out our troops, right. irrespective of, of any uh, uh, acquiescence by the Kremlin. Right, right. That exactly. I, I, again, I'm only saying as mm -hmm. to what the administration had claimed from time to time. Yeah. I'm certainly not privy to to what those well, negotiations were. You, 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 you've been quoted as um, as a, as a finding. Uh, pretty frivolous and uninformed, those who suppose that we can repay uh, Arab uh, diplomatic blackmail by... Uh, holding back wheat. Uh, uh, yes, by mm -hmm. holding back uh, wheat on the grounds that the Arabs can get it somewhere else because they don't yes, need right, it in large right, enough numbers. Right, right. Uh, it, are you making, in that particular case, an observation confined to the use of wheat as a diplomatic weapon, uh, or are you making a theoretical uh, observation? Are you saying it's all right to use wheat for diplomatic purposes if, in fact, it will work? But, or are you saying, uh, under no circumstances, ought we to hold back uh, the export of wheat? Well, I, uh, it's always been my feeling that, that food and trade in food was something that hopefully would help to rationalize the world's economy and to rationalize its politics. And so I've been always reluctant as 
uh, an editor to advocate a position that would restrict trade for reasons of retaliation, for reasons of extracting uh, promises that I'm not sure can be kept in those terms, because uh, our trade in wheat with Russia and China ref occurs at times when they have poor crops. And if they have a year of a bountiful crop, they might be exporting in competition against this. And you know, it, it could be a very short-term advantage. It's not like petroleum, where you need so much year after year. Crops suffer from the fact that you can't fine-tune production, and you have a shortage one, well, well, one year and a surplus next, like we do in this, in, in this country. So wheat, it seems to me, or food, we don't, I don't think, can look on Russia as a long-term major customer for our grains. And but so, but yeah. is, isn't, it, isn't it a fact uh, that uh, the Soviet Union's uh, uh, backwardness in agriculture continues to be attested to by the fact that they have to devote 50% of the working population to agriculture? In contrast, our figures are what, uh, six, seven percent? Four percent. Four percent. Yeah. It's four percent. So, so, so that therefore, uh, their, their, their obstinate and doctrinaire refusal to uh, permit free agriculture uh, suggests that they are, they are always going to be, they are prepared to be perpetually hamstrung uh, as, as a result of uh, their insistence on the there, well, 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 there is no doubt that their system, the system of the communes and things like that, has failed very miserably to produce food, but because they are willing to devote 50% of their resources to the production of food, they're perhaps going to do it. If they would ever make a decision that they want to reduce their part of their population that grows food to 4 or 5% like we do, then they're going to have to find a food system that works. But as long as they're willing as a matter of policy, and this I understand is a matter of political policy with them and a matter of social policy, but they want 50% of the people on the farms. They don't want them in in the cities. You know, for instance, of China, where 90% of the people are on farms and 10% run the country, run the army, run or run the factories, would ever make that kind of decision too. They probably would need a different farm, farm, or farming system from what they have. Ours is much more efficient, but, but as long as Russia makes that 50% decision, they can probably raise enough food internally for, for their own needs. Uh, so, you know, and as long as they control their population and keep it under some the, the growth in, in, well, in numbers. So I don't think that food itself is an effective weapon for us to use in political and military negotiations with Russia. Although it's interesting, you know, if this thing on the immigration is the first concrete concession they have ever made to us, as some people have described it, that came because they want to trade. Yes. And that trade includes a great deal of grain. Right. They, want, they want to be able to buy grain. Right. And so it's all part of that package. But whether grain alone is an effective weapon to use withholding grain to extract some kind of military advantages. Well, uh, <clears throat> ju just to, to, to acquaint people who are interested with the numbers involved, mm -hmm. my, my understanding is that the Soviet Union bought from us approximately 25% of what we produced in the yes, course of the yes, years, yes. right? Yeah, right, right. They bought about 10 million to 11 to 12 million tons, and we raise mm -hmm. a wheat crop 45 to 50 million tons a year. Yeah, and uh, enough to feed 100 million Americans, no, no enough to feed uh, all Americans for 100 days is another way I've heard it put. Is that about right? I, I'm but not familiar with those way, figures, yeah. but it would, uh, certainly would, would certainly say well, that. Now, did they consume that, or did they consume about half of it and put half of it away for a well, 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 those or? are two, two points, I think, that are important to be made here before we... They did consume it, but let me say that in the period from 72, the food price indexes that we see for around the world, Russia is the only country that has not had its food prices raised since the summer of 72. Well, but food prices are a matter of posture. Yeah, right, 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 right. But Russia, secondly, is the only country of significant size in the world that has added to its grain stocks since the summer of 72. Net. You know, net, 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 net increase. Russia ground that wheat into flour, but that doesn't mean very much. We know because they had milling technicians come to the United States to study how they grind the type of wheat that's grown in Kansas City. And uh, they had problems with it from a technical point of view and wanted to learn how best to use it. Uh, they probably took their own wheat 
that was of poor quality. One of their problems with the harvest in 72 was that it rained, and the grain was of poor quality, and that's very difficult to mill, and fed it to the animals. So whether they ground ours and fed theirs, it's no, so far as we know, all of our wheat was, you know, good, dry, sound wheat, as we call it in the mm -hmm. trade, and it was ground in, in mills. It wasn't put into a stockpile, but it was used. And I understand they, they like the quality very much. <laughs> well, do, do, we, do, we, do we assume from that that um, they are guarding uh, strategically against the possibility of another bad crop? I don't think there's any doubt about it, and that's, of course, my main concern with our with that we don't have a food policy that is consciously aimed toward building up a reserve in this country. It really disturbs me. Russia does. China, one of Chairman Mao's sayings, I understand you see all over China, is dig tunnels deep and store grain. Yeah. And when you go, with people tell me who have gone to China, that when you go to a commune, they very proudly go out and show you their warehouses with bags of grain in it, rather primitive compared to what we might do here. But they are having conscious policies of storing grain. We have had, for the last two or three years, a policy of just sell it to anyone who wants to buy it. We're always going to be able to raise enough. This summer, we found out that isn't always true. We had a very bad summer. And yet you objected when the president canceled uh, uh, or forced two exporters to rescind yeah, right. commitments well, made a month or so ago to send grain to more grain to the Soviet Right, right. I, 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 that, that, that to me was, as I said in one of the editorials, now that he's done completely the right thing in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And let me say what I meant by that. I meant that if we had had a conscious reserve program and a food policy program in this country, canceling both commercial sales, which were made in good faith, would not have been necessary. We would have been able to, to have had some understanding with the exporting companies and with the, ex and with the importing co countries that we were going to save so much here, and it wouldn't have been necessary for, for Mr. Ford to call those people to the White House on that awful Friday, I call it Black Friday, and, and, and to have said you have to cancel a sale that was made in good faith. Well, what would be a rational program, and what sort of numbers are you talking about if, uh, if we produce um, about 45 million tons a year, how large a supply would you, would you think prudently one ought to keep in reserve? There and is, what would it cost? There, th there is no agreement in my mind, much less among people who study this, as how much the quantity should be. And I don't think the quantity is significant. We talk of, oh, there are figures men mentioned like from 7 million to 10 million tons. That's 200 to 350 mil That's about million bushels. That's two and a supply. We use in this country for food about 500 to 600 million bushels a year. So if you're talking about a 200 million, million I wish you stick the bushels of tons. To okay, I, 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 re I realize that, and I, I'm sorry. We're all guilty of that. I'm glad when we go on a metric system <laughs> that I won't have any problem. <laughs> but I have to think of both, and some people like to have bushels and some tons, so it's difficult. But uh, let's stick to bushels. We okay. we have a we grow a wheat crop in this country this year of about a billion seven hundred million bushels. Yeah. We use about 500 to 600 million for food. Uh, we are going to export about a billion bushels, according to the Department of Agriculture's forecast. That's, and we're speaking of a crop year that begins on July 1 and ends on June 30th. That's mm -hmm. the way the wheat crop years are done. And we'll use a couple hundred million bushels for feed in this country. Feed is a swing thing because feed, wheat is used for feed if the economics are right. right. Uh, and the economics are not very good for feeding wheat for this year, so it'll be a rather low kind of figure. So if we have a carryover, of let's say 200 million bushels. That's insignificant in comparison to our need. But the fact, in my mind, the important thing is for a government that declares they're going to have a conscious food policy that means the accumulation of reserves is at least saying something to the rest of the world that we're going to look at how we manage our food supply in a rational way. I, I, I've come to the conclusion that the level, whether it's a billion bushels or 200 million, is not anywhere near as important as just saying that we're going to administer an agricultural policy in a way that we will make sure that our carryover at the end of this year is not going to be any less than some figure. Well, then, really what you, uh, the, as I understand it, then the function of your proposed policy is less to save against the possibility of internal shortages measured, measured in hunger uh, as to stabilize? 
we, we, well, we in this country, it would be the most calamitous kind of crop failure for us not to raise enough food to feed ourselves. Yeah, because we raise yeah, three right. times. We, we, we raise three times as much as we use in this in this country in wheat, yeah. and this is in a good year. So that's just not and foreseeable. Have, and so that's not for, foreseeable, but I personally am not happy with the thought of a world we would have to tell Japan and England and Germany and Morocco and Brazil and and all the countries in the world who really have built up their own ec or economic sy or, or, or system with the thought they can rely on us for food. This is, you know, the yeah. old Adam Smith ideas of the specialization, and we can grow wheat and we can grow corn better than anyone else in the world. They shouldn't do it, and J the whole post-war post economy of Japan is fueled on the basis that they will be able to buy their food from us, and they can concentrate on electronics and, yeah. and the things that, they, that, that, that they've done. So that we can always not be hungry in this country is not, to me, a very satisfactory solution. It's something that Mr. Butts has said from time to time. When he says it, I, I get very nervous, because I'm not sure he understands that a lot of other people count on us for food, too. Sure, sure. Well, let me, let me put it this way. Um, uh, the Chinese guy over in Rome, uh, who uh, criticized our Public Law 480. Yes, right. Pub our Public Law 480, as I understand it, is the law that uh, permits us to, um, to subsidize a, a price in order no. to keep our stuff. It, well, it, it, what, what it really is is a, is a dumping law, isn't it? It was a law that was passed in 54 when we were yeah. bothered with surpluses. Mm -hmm. And it was a law that simply allowed us to pour millions of bushels, hundreds of millions of bushels of wheat into India and into to Europe who needed it then and, in, and into developing con con countries to get rid of our surpluses. Right. And at the same time, we supposedly were doing them some favor. Yeah. They wanted it. They asked for it. Uh, in Vietnam and in Indonesia, millions and millions of bushels of grain and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars have been used to get rid of our surpluses. It basically was a a, a way to support the domestic market right. while getting rid of surpluses. Yeah. And, you know... But it had, it had the effect, according to this um, uh, Chinese gentleman, uh, and I've heard the complaint around the world from <laughs> other people, it had the effect of, uh, in the first place, depriving uh, other countries of the ad advantage of uh, seasonal scarcities by driving down the price, for instance, of rice. Uh, but I, it also <coughs> discouraged them, or so they claim, uh, from developing and forming the, the capital necessary to, uh, to develop the exploitation of uh, agriculture in their own countries. If you know that America is going to be a constant supply at $1.60, yeah. uh, and uh, you need for that price to go up to $1.90 before you can borrow the money to buy the agriculture, mm -hmm. but to buy the fertilizer or whatever, it, it's going to be uh, continually aborted. Now, do they have a good point? Yes, that, 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 well, that's, that's, that's an excellent kind of point, but it's a matter of these countries still today, probably their prime problem is they're still interested in cheap food policies for yeah. their people. And you can't have a cheap food policy without the incentives and absent the incentives to the farmers to invest in, in, in modern techniques of production and fertilizer and in all that's required. And, but PL 480 was one of those things, India is starving to death, now what do you do? You tell India we're not going to give you 100 million bushels a week because you've got to get in there and do that farming yourself. And so there was that you know, very difficult kind of line to, to, uh, to walk, and I don't think anybody in this country should be ashamed or say that we ruined ag well, agriculture in the rest of the world by having this PL 480 program. It, probably we spent 20, 30 billion dollars over, well, over, well, over the 20 year history of that law, and you know, it did do some good. It brought Korea <coughs> to the place where it is really a viable market economy now, buying a large part of wheat commercially from us, growing other crops very well. It helped a number of countries. In India, it didn't work, and I think it didn't work in India because India has had this confused wanting to have cheap food to consumers and, and trying to hold down farm prices by bringing in imports and dumping them on their market. And it was a misinterpretation of how an agricultural economy best works. Well, th that, uh, that being the case, do you do you reason that there should or should not be a change in public law 480? Well, there, in effect, is no public law 480 now to speak because of. Because there isn't that kind because of Because the, the law first provides 
but the only commodities that can be programmed are, pro are commodities surplus of needs in this country. Mm -hmm. And there are very, very few. The only thing we have now is rice. We're having, we have a very large rice crop in this country. And we are the world's largest exporters of rice, even though we are among the world's smallest producers of rice. But the large producers in Southeast Asia consume it all locally. And, we, and our, our consumption of rice in this country is at a very low level compared to, to, those, to, to those parts of the world. But we have nothing in surplus, so PL 480 does not work. President Ford has asked Congress in, in his economic me message, he asked Congress for the right to change PL 480 to let them use it in ways when there aren't surpluses. And you know, one wonders, one wonders in this country, here in India right now, and other parts of Southeast Asia are really on the brink of what they've been on the brink of almost every other year for the last 20, of really uh, of 500, 600 million people having, being malnourished or, or starving, you know. And it's, it's very, very hard stuff. And the question becomes one, do we go into our market and the government says, we're going to give India a million, t a mi 36 million bushels, or 50 million bushels, or 100 million bushels. Go into our market and buy that and ship it to India. Our prices will go sharply higher here. We'll have the dollar bread we heard so much about last winter. And it will be a thing where the American consumer will be paying for these kinds of programs. And this is a choice that has to be made. Do we want to ship wheat and earn, and earn foreign exchange to dollar customers? To help pay for the oil and the on the automobiles and the other things we might import do we want to send aid to these countries because if we do sure as the devil the, the price is going to be reflected to the american consumer and that's what the consumers in this country really have not understood they're not competing when they go to the supermarket with just their neighbor for that food they're cons competing with export club in yeah. russia and the china national grain corporation and people in south africa and everywhere well, my, my feeling has always been that uh, the American public uh, uh, tends to respond, uh, I think, uh, uh, copiously to, um, to flash emergencies. You know, if uh, Central Africa goes yeah. three years without rain, I think that uh, the disposition is to, to help Central Africa. Uh, I think, however, that uh, in the last um, eight or ten years, there has been a, a hardening, not so much of, of, of the heart, uh, as um, a, a hardening intellectual uh, uh, analysis. The, the old point four idea yeah, was right. that we would go and show them how we did it so that they could emulate it mm -hmm. and then proceed to take care of themselves. But uh, ten billion dollars later, uh, India seems to be as incompetent uh, as it was pre $10 billion worth of wheat and pre, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, pre point four. Right. Now, is, are, are, are we, is anybody in American agriculture among the theorists or among the politicians engaged in articulating a policy, the effect of which would have some implicit terminal clause uh, uh, in it? or? Is the difficulty there that they, they, there's too much of a resistance of a cultural imperialism and exploitation of capitalist techniques? And that kind no, of well, the, P the PL 480 law has been amended from the first time it was passed in '54, and Congress uh, during the '60s passed, and there shall be no more. You know, for many years when we gave food to India, we accepted ru oh, rupees. And those rupees just sat in India, and we had more and rupees than to, India had, yeah, sure. and so we've had to give it back to them. So Congress itself brought an end to this. They said. Now, PL 480, when a country gets grain under, well, under that program, is required to repay us in dollars. Now, Egypt and a few of those countries have not really kept up with those credit terms, and, uh, uh, but I, they're still being worked out. So the program has been changed. It seems to me that you know, what we really have to do now, because we recognize that demand for food, we're beginning to see all those things we've heard all of our lives as a population, a rising standard of living, is suddenly exhausting the world's ability to raise food according to present technology. There's a vast amount of land in Asia and in, and, and in Africa and in South America that could be used to raise crops if the incentives were given. So the problem is how do we transfer this you know, wonderful American technology? And I'm not being jingoist about this. It really is. Uh, we 
our yields are higher than anyone else's and our ability to market it is more efficient than anyone else's and at lower cost. Can we transfer this to India? And the, and the, argu and the argument now is, like, can we transfer our political system to India? Maybe not. Are we, somebody somewhere is going to have to devise a way to teach these people and to give them the incentives, the price incentives that come in the marketplace, and, and to encourage them to raise the crops. There has been too much attention to pouring food, which is the humanitarian approach to the thing, and not enough of this long-range attention to how we really stimulate enough investment in this country. Well, I, the, the, some, some people, though, um, um, are fond of pointing to the Middle West and and treating it as, as they would, say, uh, the Bordeaux country of France. You know, that it, that's where you go to get certain sure. grapes, yeah. this is where you go to get a lot of wheat, yeah. and that you just can't duplicate the conditions. But that, that's nonsense, isn't it, or is it? There, well, there is a, we do have an, an advantage. The area from Texas to the Canadian prairies is really rather a unique plains region for dry land for growing wheat where the rain always comes at the right time it rains in the fall and it rains in the spring and it allows us to, to grow to, to grow the crops but if you take your finger in the southern hem well, he well hemisphere on a globe and go those same latitudes and longitudes down there there's a lot of land mass that no one's done anything with and you do it north now russia has a problem but what is it 75 percent of russia is north of minneapolis that's, it's, we don't grow too much. We grow some spring wheat, and Canada certainly is a very productive con well, country, but they can't grow corn, they can't grow soybeans in that latitude. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so we do have, an, and, and in China, most of this latitude and longitude is in mountainous, so, so we do have a little bit of a blessing out here as to how we are located. And we can grow probably much more than we are growing now as techniques and new varieties and improved yields and hybrid wheat is coming now and all, and, and all this kind of thing happens to us. But, there is a great deal that can be grown in other parts of the world. If you look at a list of yields and see that our yields are twice or three times what the yields of wheat or the yields of grain sorghum are in countries that have similar land and moisture to ours, it's, you, you know they have a long way to go. You know, um, uh, I heard an interesting story one time from uh, Professor Colin Clark. Do mm -hmm. you know who he is? Yes, yes. The agricultural mm -hmm. economist. Mm -hmm. He was at a reception with Mohandas Gandhi about two or three weeks before Gandhi was assassinated. And he just published a long study of Indian agriculture. And Gandhi called him over and he said, Mr. Clark, do you want to know why uh, there's so uh, a little agriculture in India? And Clark said, well, yes. <laughs> he said, because Indians are lazy. Now, uh, this is an observation which, uh, had it been uttered by someone else, yeah. would have sounded at least uh, ethnocentric, perhaps even genocidal. Yeah, right. Now, <laughs> lazy is also a short form way of saying a whole lot of other yeah. things. Right. Maybe it means lacking a foresight or, or, or whatever. Yeah. Right. Now, w is it assumed that um, Indians, India's problem is, is, is metaphysical or is it cultural? The, 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 the distinction between the two being uh, is it a problem that cannot be fixed, given the population and the geography? Or is it a problem that could be fixed if, for instance, you could endow uh, 50 million Indians with the, the know-how and the cultural attitude of the farmers of the Midwest of America? Uh, let me tell you a story, too. Lord, what, 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 what Lord Palmerston supposedly said a hundred years ago, whenever he was the prime minister, that India has had a very successful famine, mm -hmm. and you know, and really, I think that they uh, uh, kind of, you know, that's kind of a horrible thing in this, yeah. in this, well, in this day and age. But, but, but there are there are people, there are university people who have spent many years in India and come back very discouraged that they'll ever be able to feed themselves. India periodically. The Minister of Agriculture stands up in the Parliament and announces we have achieved self-sufficiency in food. In fact, a couple of years ago, India was, was wrestling with the problem of how they're going to handle this vast amount of grain exporting they're going to do because they had these miracle varieties of wheat that were developed by Norman Borlaug in Mexico, where it went to India. They had tremendous in o o increases in yields. But those varieties, they're marvelous, but they require two things beside technology. They require doses, vast doses of fertilizer, and they require perfect water conditions. And so the minute that India gets short of fertilizer, due to the petroleum thing, let's say, the minute the, the, the monsoon rains don't come at the right time, their technology just falls apart, and those 
miracle varieties suddenly yield less than the old standard varieties that they had thrown out when, when, when anything goes less than perfect. So, so whether I, I, I just don't know, but people mm -hmm. who have gone to India, who have spent years there trying to teach and starting to have agricultural universities, maybe would say there's some curse on the whole thing that is not going to make it. But there are 550 million people, and they, they do have an, uh, uh, an atomic bomb and all this kind of thing now, or have atomic capabilities. And it's kind of a nervous condition for the world to think that 550 million people uh, are a good number of those people, like in Bangladesh and Pakistan too this year, are faced with famine. You know, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing where revolution is, uh, is, uh, occurs if, uh, if we, you know, and uh, it's our military uh, posture to maintain India at least as a neutral country. And, you know, I'm sure the Chinese would love to have them have some kind of horrible thing happen as a result of, of this food thing. So it really puts us in a, in a real dilemma. And I don't think the solution would be for us to say, India, you've got to take care of yourself. I, I just, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people don't understand that. Well, you're, you're pointing, though, to the, uh, to the erratic uh, rainfall <clears throat> and to uh, a shortage of fertilizer that results from uh, uh, fractious Arab Persian Gulf policy. Mm -hmm. Are you intending to emphasize factors beyond the control of Indians? Uh, uh, is it, was that, was it? Yeah, that there, there, well, that, well, that's part of it. But in, a, well, in America, too, we have periods of erratic rainfall. We had problems in distribution of fertilizer. And our farmers are, are uh, skillful enough to at least react to that in some way. Of course, we had a July drought in, in the central part of this country that impacted our corn crop. And there was no technology that could have prevented that. But let's say it could have been worse if we had not, if the farmers in our country had not been as skillful or as willing to work or, you know, to try and save those crops. So there, so there is some techniques that can go on. But you can't rule out. I mean, the world, there is no way, you know, when everybody says, well, everything's going to be fine because we're going to have big crops, there's no way we can know. We don't know from one week to the next what crops are going to be. We, well, we have, so we have people, so many crop reporters in Oklahoma and Kansas that almost sometimes we joke about they're going to trample the fields, going and inspect mm -hmm. it. And we can't tell from, we can't say on, on May 1 what the crop's going to be on June 1 or July 1. There are changes that occur as a result of weather. And so I kind of laugh when, ev when everybody starts talking about we ought to know more about the Russian crop. I'm sure they'd like to know more about their crop too, but these are difficult kinds of things mm -hmm. to, to forecast what a crop yield is going to be. Well, has, has there been uh, a, a, uh, a, a great improvement in India in the in per capita production yeah, well, in the last I, 25 years? Well, I think you mean there has been some improvement, but it, had, it has not kept pace with the growth in the population of the country. No, I don't mean that. Okay. I said production. Per capita uh, not, production, not no. Per capita production, it is my feeling, has been unchanged ever since the last 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 years. Whatever growth there's been in the crop, it has been offset by a growth in numbers of people. And if there's even the slightest bit of improvement in standard of living, you know, if somebody brings home an extra dollar or two a week, spent it goes on food, right away to food, it yeah. goes right to food, and uh, that it has not kept pace with that. Yeah. It has not kept pace. And they're net behind. That's why they need the imports. So, so uh, after, tw <clears throat> after 25 years of uh, experience with highly technologized uh, agriculture, you're saying that the actual Indian agriculture worker in a typical year, manufactures no more rice or whatever than he did 25 years ago? To, on an average, yes, yes. Though there are certain parts of the, there are farms where they have, in, where they have introduced these varieties, but again, those farms are, are large farms controlled by, uh, you know, in, in, but the Indian farmer has not improved his technology at all. Uh, Professor Gene Wagner, is with the Economics Department here at the University of Missouri. Mr. Wagner. Mr. Soslin, the Cold War years have been waiting for r the Russian people to starve to death for the last 40 or 50 years. But with our knowledge of the uh, conversion ratio of wheat to meat, if you will, 10 or 20 to 1, whatever it is, and Russia's decision to feed uh, meat rather than wheat to its people, mm -hmm. Didn't this, as a matter of fact, send up a signal to the rest of the 
other developed countries of the world that uh, the brotherhood of working men with regard to Russia, at least in the four, um, that it was a direct announcement of nationalism, and will this not affect, if you will, the stature of Russia relative to, say, China? And uh, with respect to India, for example, it's a choice between it, Russian it, people. It, it, it might, because in the context of the present grain situation, to <coughs> declare that my country now is going to eat meat is a very, you know, you might call that, quote, a selfish, end quote, decision, because it takes eight pounds of, of grain to make a pound, a pound of beef. Uh, but, you know, whether we're always going to be in a period of shortage in grain is, is the other part of that. And I, for one, don't believe we ought to encourage Americans to not eat meat one day a week in, in some kind of a, of a, a totemic uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 bowing to, to, well, to hunger around, around the world. Uh, so Russia's decision to eat meat and to maintain that was made in the context that they too are going to be able to raise grain enough to feed their animals, to feed their numbers. And that Russia has never put itself in the posture of sharing its grain with other people. They have not. We're the ones who've got caught on that act. Russia has never, no one, Indian, you know, has begged Russia for a few million tons of grain, and they have given it. But Russia has never fed hungry peoples around the world. It's we who got in, what, what, in, what, into that trap. So I think that Russia is liable to end up being people are going to envy them because they're improving the diets of their people rather than depriving other people of grain. You, you know, this, this could be one of the results of that. I, again, I'm not a, a politician, so I don't know, but I know this is what is happening. You know, the desire to have hamburgers is, you know, as strong a desire as, as anything in this world. It's and, a compulsion. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a good thing to call it. It really is. Imagine a party coming out for closing the McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are people who are saying this, and I really think it's misinterpreting what's going on. This well, grain meat thing is a, is a, you know, for us to say that we should not feed beef. It, the market is saying that. You know, grain prices are too high for a cattleman to feed. And there's just a very clear signal in this marketplace of ours saying, damn it, the world wants to eat grain and doesn't want to eat meat. And the cattlemen are not going to feed grain to livestock, and the market's going to solve that. And we're going to start eating Mexican beef, in a sense. That's right. We're, we're, we're going to eat... rather than grain-fed. But, you know, again, I think we can get very used to that. I don't think, you know... I, I our... can't imagine that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Professor Carla Klausner is from the History Department. Yes, I'd also like to ask Mr. Soslin if there is not an inherent conflict between the evident benefits of freer trade versus the nature of new obligations um, on a worldwide basis to help the developing countries. Do not these obligations work against freer trade? And also, and in conjunction with this, um, Mr. Kissinger has suggested that we all had better think about an international food reserve. Mm -hmm. Mr. Butts seems to have different ideas, and I'd like to know what your views are about international reserves. Grain is a finite quantity. That's what's marvelous about being an economist in grain. There's no way we have, we harvested our grain in July and August and the first part of September, our wheat, and there is no way we can create any more. And we have so many billion bushels and we're able to count it. And so much goes to domestic use in this country and then we have to decide how we're going to divide it up. And we have said we're going to let commercial buyers come in. And what essentially has happened is we have let Russia buy or we have let China buy, or we have let Japan buy, or Morocco buy. And in these years of a limited finite quantity, we suddenly have said there's no more left for India, and there's no more left for Pakistan, or Indonesia, or Vietnam. And we, you know, it does, there, there is. You know, these are, it's just like a parent who, who has a family budget. You've got to divide it up, and one child maybe is going to be unhappy compared to the other one. And if one, and if you give it to the bigger one, you're, you're, you're maybe not doing the right thing. And so there, there are these choices to, to be made. Uh, as far as this disagreement between Mr. Butts and Mr. Kissinger, I, I really don't know how, how serious that disagreement is because I think there's been a great joining of, uh, of, uh, of opinions. Mr. Butts's views against reserves have softened very much in the last uh, 
a few months as the new president came, 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 came in. And I think the U.S. probably will help an international grain reserve. We'll have to be one of the major contributors. I hope if we are, that we will keep control of this ourselves. I would hate to see the control of that reserve, grain that we had contributed to it, given to somebody who is sitting in Rome or Geneva or something like that. I think we ought to, if we're going to make that contribution, we ought to have the right to say where it's going to be used ourselves. And what criteria would you observe? I would, well, I would have to be a matter. Someone in this country has to make agricultural policy decisions of those kind. You know, there, there, there has to be. It's a government reserve, and someone within the government has, has, has to do it. And uh, for me to, you know, you know, he's going to have to make a decision whether it's in our interest. These PL 480 was used not just for humanitarian re reasons. It was used for, for military re re reasons. Most of the PL 480 in the last couple of years has gone to Vietnam. It helped to pay for the military things there and help to sustain that government. And so we, it's not all been a matter of dumping, like we were talking earlier. And somebody's going to have to decide, I guess, what's in our best interest. And I guess those best interests where the conflicts come are the humanitarian interests versus the military political ones. And these are difficult decisions, but somebody has to make them. If we do contribute to an international grain reserve, should we not also insist that our new trading partners, like the Soviet Union, do this, and what are the inherent difficulties in their participating? Well, they, for instance, don't are not even members of the FAO, right. and uh, you know they obviously again we're the ones who everyone looks to. No one even will, will even looks to them. The OPEC countries, for goodness' sakes, with the money that they have now, should help finance some of these some of these reserves. And again, but it's one of those things. Can we stand there and say we're not going to do it unless you do it? We've never done that, regrettably. In, in our negotiations with the rest of the world. If no one else does it, then we pay half the budget or three quarters of the budget. And, uh, you know, and, but, but, but if we don't, people starve to death because we won't give them the food. And that's a, that's a bad thing to carry around on your back, but it sure gets put on our back. Uh, Professor Richard McKenzie is also with the History Department. Mr. McKenzie? Yes. Mr. Soslin, um, you've talked about uh, uh, your unwillingness to see food as a, uh, a political or diplomatic tool. But in fact, isn't it a political and diplomatic tool already, particularly in light of the discussions which are currently underway in Rome? The Indian foreign minister announced at that conference recently that the state of agriculture in, Indus, in India is due to centuries of colonial rule. And he has said because the developed powers were the cause of the condition of Indian agriculture, it now becomes their duty to help in the form of uh, huge quantities of food. He further said, whatever help is rendered to them now should not be regarded as charity, but deferred compensation for what has been done by them <laughs> in the past. And so are we not then responsible for the sins of the fathers? I'd like for Mr. Buckley to answer that question. I think he could do it much better than I. I think that's a well, lot I, of nonsense. I, I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember when we last colonized India. Either. No, no. I, I, it's uh, well. That's well, well. That's ridiculous. But that's the attitude that many countries of the world have toward. Again, we over a period of time have gotten ourselves into this neat little box of being responsible for feeding the world. We do raise food more efficiently than, than anyone else. I think it's time we tried to get ourselves out from under this box. I'm, but I'm, again, I'm not comfortable telling India, you have to have a successful famine and goodbye. You, you, you know, this is, I, I don't think this is part of our morals or part of our, I don't think the American people Do you remember a thing called the Cam Amendment? No. There was a senator from around here somewhere. Get from Missouri. Cam, oh, 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 James Cam, sure. Yeah. I, I remember, I remember Senator Cam. I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, he, he, he tried this out in 1946. Said that no American martial aid could go to any country that was engaged in socializing its economy. Yeah, I, I remember that. that. I do, I, 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 I do remember that. That you, there's no point in in helping a country uh, 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 diminish yeah. its output I when the whole point that. was to maximize output. Well, there was hell to pay. Oh. Because right, this, right, this was interference. Right. This, is, uh, this, this is so called Senator imperialism. Camp, never, never heard from again. Yeah, it's well, called uh, imperialism when we, when we do that kind of thing. But really, mm -hmm. if we at that time perhaps had not done, let's say that, but had really insisted that these countries do something in the way of improving their, ag their agriculture, that there be some kind of quid pro quo. 
quo in investment made in improving their farming technology or in building a road system or, or buying combines or something so elemental as that, that, that I'm sure the world would be in a better place. And I hope we've learned that lesson now. And that, you know, as this whole thing is, is not anywhere, it's, it's worse. It's worse today. We're all sitting here in 1974, and it's worse today than when we began. And I hope we've learned that lesson, because now we now know, we worry about the impact of this demand on our own food prices and our own economy. And uh, so it's important for us to, to extract some improvement from the well, the, the comment that Mr. Buckley man, uh, made about the uh, Kim Amendment uh, is interesting because that created a, uh, a government committee which was uh, mo mostly composed of Defense Department people who were supposed to pass upon those things which were exported from the United States and determine those items which went to communist countries which might be militarily helpful to them mm -hmm. and to protest such exportation so that it might be stopped and might not food. It's always been in the past, uh, minerals or industrial items, but might not food, given the nature of the world food crisis, soon be placed on such uh, prohibited lists? It, it, it perhaps could. I guess I'm, I'm interested in, we're, we've been talking a lot about using food exports as a political thing. Food buying, buying in our country by other countries becomes a political Thing against us, you know. I have always been worried that that that, that, that over, over Russia, for less than the cost of a nuclear submarine, could in effect wreak havoc in our food economy, which in effect they've done. You know, it's you know wars are not just fought with with guns, and that we spend a hundred billion dollars or plus on on a defense program, and then say we can let them buy anything they want to in the way of, of grain from us, has always been sort of a you know, I think we ought to understand, have an understanding with them, because the, the, politi the, the politicalization of food, I resist our doing it, but I also resist our naivete not thinking there are other people out there who might try and do that against us. And this is, this is one of the, the real kind of problems in this. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, uh, let's go back to the fact that Russia, in terms of the history of the Cold War, you know, and the Paddock brothers in famine 1975, yes. that we use this as a, as a mechanism for, for, if you will, freeing the world, uh, Russia, China, whatever it is. But is it not in fact the case that with, if we check the, the spark points or the flash points of the world, that they're not under the communist yoke? As a matter of fact, they do have food policies in China and in Russia. The real flash points are those areas which we have been trying to keep within uh, the capitalist orbit or the whatever you want to call it for the last uh, 25 or 30 years. India is a case in point, Africa across the top of Africa, Nigeria, the, this whole region. Mm -hmm. So that to use it in terms of the classic Cold War fight really will mm -hmm. not cut the mustard. Mm -hmm. With regard to the Arabs, which are number one on our priority yeah. list these days, even there if we shut it out, they can buy it from Argentina right. through, through the Australia. international market. Right. So, so does the paddock argument make sense, or the argument of my colleague with regard to using it as a military mechanism for rather than an atomic bomb? Well, I think we're really, I think you, you have one assumption there that, that Russia and China do not have food problems is probably wrong. They, the, the level of, of, uh, of food consumption in China is far inferior to ours. Well, they, they and, you know, and, and, not long and ago they, they ate their dogs and cats. Yeah, right, right. And, and, you know, and if, if, you know, if every Chinese wanted to eat a half a pound of chicken per month more than they do now, there's no way the world could raise that much grain. So they have, main, they have solved their food problem by a, uh, by a type of military control of their people that I don't think we consider acceptable. And Russia has solved theirs in the same way, but has had, but as they become more consumer-minded, if that's what's going on there. They now are having these problems. So I don't think that we can, you know, if, well, if the answer to the food problem is a massive food rationing system, we certainly, there is enough food in the world. And if you and I could only eat, you know, have a, a bowl of rice for supper, maybe our doctors would say we'd be better off. I don't know. But that's not the way we've elected to, to conduct but our lives. But isn't that only putting off again Parson Malthus for another maybe 50 years? 
we do have, I'm one who, who thinks we have the technology in this world to make sure that we're not going to have a Malthusian falling off the end of the world at some point out there, if some, something is done about population. I mean, you know, after all, it, I guess it does run off the chart if you don't. But I, I, we do have, if, if the rest of the world got anywhere near the yields that we achieve in this country, we'd have, we'd be a long way toward doing that. And there's a lot of agriculture, there's mariculture, you know, the farming of the oceans and that. Yes? Um, I'd like to ask a question about the Middle East, if we mm -hmm. can get into that for just a minute. Um, you've suggest suggested that we should perhaps not use food as a weapon, but that on the other hand, Russia wants our grain badly enough and wants trade badly enough with us mm -hmm. to make certain changes in their internal yeah. system, in their immigration policies, and so forth. The fact of the matter is that the United States buys most of its oil from the Middle East in sure. dollars, right. Right? right? Saudi Arabia, within a few years, is going to have larger... By the, by the way, that's not true. Pardon me? Excuse me, but it's not true. We don't buy most of our oil. Yeah. Excuse yeah. me. Ven from the Venezuela, OPEC countries, Canada, all right. uh, and yes. Iran. All right, from OPEC countries, I'll put it that way. But some of it, of yeah. course, does come from the Middle East. A great part mm -hmm. of it does come from the Middle East. Uh, Saudi Arabia, for one, is going to have larger hard currency reserves um, than most of the countries in the world, with right. the exception of West Germany, in a few years. Saudi Arabia gives something like $200 million a year to Egypt, who buys arms from the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm and will give something like $50 million a year to the PLO mm -hmm. to buy arms in the Soviet Union. Do we not have a right to expect more from the Soviet Union as a trading partner? Do we not have some um, right to insist on some understanding that they will not participate in? Uh, so far as I'm concerned, we can use any advantage we have to them in doing this. It's my feeling this can be carried too far. It's also, it's, you know, what's very important is that the export of grain from this country, we want to maximize it under normal conditions. The last couple of years we've had tough times, but in most years, for the last 25 years, we have tried to sell as much grain as we can, and we worked long and hard to get policies that would let USSR buy wheat from us. And what concerns me, the minute we got too tough with that, they're liable to have a big crop, and we're not only not able to extract any of those promises from us, but are able to, uh, to, to, to not buy any grain from us. And we sort of had a double whammy uh, loss there. And uh, what, what it seems to me that the best thing in the world we can do is develop a grain economy in the world that would allow us to trade with these people as, as heavily as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Sosland. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the panel. Thank you all. Printed bound transcript of this program send one dollar to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina 29250. That's one dollar to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina 29250. Production funding provided by public television stations, the Ford Foundation, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.